<laughs> I request all the participants, please mute your mic. Otherwise, I will mute you. Yes, yes, sir. Yeah. You will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, mute all. And uh, just a minute, Dr. Saif. I'm making you unmute. Yeah. Okay. So, you are unmute. Okay. So you can now present. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Neeraj. So, Zika is a flavivirus and hence is related to several other common pathogens of humans, including those that are found in the Indian subcontinent. Zika is commonly spread by mosquitoes, although it can also be spread through sexual contact and from an infected mother to an unborn fetus. A Zika virus infection typically causes a mild rash and a flu-like illness, although during the latest epidemic, a correlation was made between Zika virus infections and severe neurological symptoms in humans. Being a flavivirus, Zika has a positive single-stranded RNA genome that encodes seven non-structural proteins and three structural proteins. The non-structural proteins are enzymes that are involved mainly in genome replication, assembly of progeny particles, and evasion of the host's immune response. The structural proteins are those that go into making the virus particles. They include the envelope or E protein, the pre-membrane or PRM or its derivative membrane or M protein, and the capsid or C protein. The focus of my talk today on the envelope or E protein. Shown here is a very simplified version of a typical flavivirus replication cycle. Flavivirus particles enter host cells by receptor-mediated endocytosis. Once inside the cells, the acidification of the endosome lumen triggers a series of conformational changes in the virus that release the viral RNA genome into the cytosol. Then, the assembly of progeny particles is initiated in the endoplasmic reticulum where the particles first assemble as spiky, immature, non-infectious particles. These fully assembled but non-infectious particles are then transported into the Golgi wherein they undergo maturation into smooth, mature, infectious particles. These infectious particles are then released outside the cell for the next round of infection. Shown here is a typical structure of mature infectious flavivirus particles. The surface of these particles contain exactly 180 copies of the E protein that I've colored in red, blue, and green. These particles have what is called icosahedral symmetry. And this black triangle represents one of the 60 identical asymmetric units. Now, for my lecture, you really don't need to understand symmetry. And I'm just gonna show you the symmetry elements, but I'm not gonna use them in my lecture. So, anyway, in icosahedral symmetry, this is the asymmetric unit, and there are 60 such asymmetric units on the surface of the virus. Because there are 60 asymmetric units, but 180 copies of the E protein, then 180 divided by 60 gives you three copies of the E protein present in every asymmetric unit, as shown over here. Now, what I'm showing you over here is a cross-section through a mature infectious flavivirus particle, which is essentially the same particle but I have now cut it open. As I've mentioned, the outermost layer consists of the envelope protein. Lying directly underneath this layer is an internal lipid membrane layer whose head groups are highlighted with broken black lines. The innermost layer of the virus, shown in blue, consists of the viral RNA genome and the capsid protein. Yeah. So, as I've mentioned, each asymmetric unit contains three copies of the E protein. Although these three copies of the E protein are present in very different chemical environments, the sequences of these three chains are identical to each other. Shown here is a schematic of the Zika virus E protein sequence. There is a large ectodomain shown over here, which consists of three smaller domains called domain one, colored in red, domain two, colored in yellow, and domain three, colored in blue. This large ectodomain is followed by a short stem domain and a transmembrane domain which lies in the internal lipid membrane of the virus. In the fully folded form of the, this polypeptide, the, e protein, the domain one colored in red lies at the center, whereas domains two and three lie at opposite ends. Under cellular physiological conditions, the fully folded E protein assembles into symmetric dimers mainly through the dimerization activity of domain two colored here in yellow. In the context of the virus, there are two kinds of E-protein dimers. One that is shown in blue over here. This dimer is called the icosahedral dimer because the two monomers lie right across a crystallographic two-fold axis. 
This other group of diamonds, co colored in red and green over here, is called the general position diamond. And again, like I said, you don't need to worry about symmetry. I'm not going to use it or talk about it. But anyway, it is suffice to say that there are two groups of E protein dimers present in very different environments. Now, in the fully assembled flavivirus particles, there is a very distinct arrangement of these three ecto -pro uh, E protein ectodomains. For instance, domain one, colored in red, is found clustered around the threefold axis. Domain two, colored in yellow, is found around the twofold axis. And domain three, colored in blue, is found clustered mainly around the fivefold axis. These are the general rules of architecture that apply to every single flavivirus structure determined till date in the mature state. So now, I shall switch gears and move on to issues that are specific only to the Zika virus. As I've mentioned, during the latest epidemic, a correlation was made between Zika virus infections and severe neurological symptoms in humans. This include fetal microcephaly in humans, wherein a newborn child whose mother was infected with the virus while she was pregnant has an underdeveloped brain. In adults who are infected, a Zika virus infection leads to the Guillain-Barré syndrome, wherein it causes temporary paralysis and the patients cannot move or sometimes even breathe on their own. Given the serious nature of these symptoms, it is absolutely essential to develop therapeutics to prevent and control the progression of disease caused by the Zika virus. To this end, our collaborators at the Washington University in St. Louis and the Vanderbilt University isolated an antibody from an individual who had recovered from a Zika virus infection. They named this one antibody ZIKV117. This antibody was found to provide effective protection against the virus in a mouse model disease. Next, our collaborators mapped the epitope of this antibody partially onto the Zika virus E protein using mutagenesis. Despite these advances, three important questions remain unanswered. That is, what is the stoichiometry of binding of the antibody on the Zika virus surface? What is the mechanism by which the antibody neutralizes infections? And finally, what is the molecular reason behind the specificity of this antibody to the Zika virus? To address these three questions, we decided to perform cryo-electron microscopy on purified infectious Zika virus particles complex with fads from ZIKV117. Now, I know you, you guys don't really do a whole lot of uh, structural biology, so I'll just give you a very brief introduction to how I did the experiment, but I will not go into details of cryo-EM. So anyway, in the first step of any cryo-EM experiment, you have to prepare a sample on a cryo-EM grid. In this case, we took purified mature Zika virus particles, mixed them with fab fragments from ZIKV117, and flash froze the mixture on cryo-EM grids. For this purpose, we used a CP3 semi-automated plunger kept here in a BSL-2 con containment facility. This plunger consists of a tweezer grid assembly wherein you have this tweezer to which a tiny cryo-EM grid is attached at the end. Then you apply the sample on this grid through this narrow hole using a micropipette. Then these blotters move in to remove the excess liquid from the grid. Then the grid plunges down for flash freezing in liquid ethane. Now I'll show you a brief movie of the CP3 in action. So once you apply the sample on this cryo-EM grid, the blotters move in, remove the excess liquid, and then the assembly descends down under gravity for flash freezing. So once you have a cryo-EM grid, you insert it into a microscope for data collection. Shown here is a Titan Creos 300 kV microscope. At present, this microscope is considered to be the best for structural biology, both in terms of data quality and data quantity. This microscope is about, I'd say like 10 feet or 12 feet tall and costs about 7 million US dollars. Um, this microscope can be run completely in an automated fashion 24 seven to collect large amounts of data. So some of you might know that the Nobel Prize in Chemistry was awarded for cryo-EM uh, about uh, three years ago. And um, traditionally, um, cryo-EM has not been a technique of choice for high resolution determination. This is because some of the electrons incident on biological samples cause blurring of the samples due to inelastic scattering. 
this is the same problem that you face when you try to take a photograph with your cell phone and somebody moves their hands. And then in the photograph, all you see is a blur of the hand. So this problem in cryo-EM is called beam-induced motion, wherein electrons incident on biological samples deposit energy on the samples, causing the particles to move while we are imaging them. This problem of beam-induced motion leads to a loss of higher resolution features. And this problem has now been overcome to a significant extent with the invention of something called the direct electron detector. These detectors record movies instead of static images. These movies of biological samples are then fractionated into frames of very short duration. Each frame is then corrected for particle motion and realigned and averaged back with the other frames to greatly boost the high resolution signal. Using this technology in our direct electron detector and Titan Creo system, we collected several hundred, several thousand movies of the Zika virus complex with ZIKV117. Shown here is a motion corrected cryo EM image of the Zika virus FAP complex. I have highlighted one Zika virus particle that is covered on its surface with FAPs. As you can probably see over here, you do not observe any high resolution features. This is because cryo EM is inherently a low contrast technique. To achieve high contrast, and high resolution, you need to average between thousands to millions of particles. Shown here is the result of a cryo EM reconstruction achieved by averaging together 50 to 60,000 uh, Zika virus particles. This is a cryo EM map of the Zika virus particle. Shown in yellow over here are the anvular proteins of the virus. Shown in red over here in knobs are the fab fragments that are bound on the viral surface. The triangle that I've shown over here is the same icosahedral asymmetric unit that I've been showing in the past images. As each asymmetric unit contains three individual copies of the E protein, we expected to find three copies of the ZIKV117 fab bound to this asymmetric unit. That is, one fab bound to each of these three individual chains. The fab position located closest to this twofold axis was named 2F whereas the FAP position located closest to the threefold axis was named 3F. The FAP position located closest to the fivefold axis and named 5F was found to contain very poor density for the FAP. What this means is that the FAP is unable to bind at the site. This was completely unexpected. We did not expect to find such a problem at all when we started doing our experiments. So to determine the factors responsible for poor binding of FAP at the site, we constructed what is called a radially colored roadmap of the Zika virus surface. Here, each amino acid in the E protein, in the envelope protein, is shown as a crudely drawn circle. These circles are colored according to their distance from the viral center. The residues located closest to the center on the viral surface are colored dark blue, as shown over here, for instance, and also over here. On the other hand, the residues located farthest away from the viral center and at the highest elevation on the viral surface are colored in red and shown over here, for instance. This triangle is the same asymmetric unit. A close inspection of our roadmap showed that near the expected 5F site, there was a cluster of E protein residues located at a very high elevation. I've colored them in red as shown over here. In effect, this cluster of E protein residues acts as a mountain that restricts access to the 5F site, which is located at the foot of the mountain. What this essentially means is that if an antibody or a fab is trying to bind over here, it will be unable to do so simply because this binding site lies at the very foot of this large mountain next to it. And so there will be steric clashes and the antibody will not be able to access the 5F binding site. Your answer, designation to lecture. Yeah. So. Requesting a please. Hello, please. Hello, please. Hello, Palak Ramesh. 
ਤੂੰ ਮੋਕਲੀ ਸਤਨ ਉਹਨੂੰ ਕੁੱਟਾ ਤੇ ਡੱਬੀ ਲਈ ਕਰਨਾ ਅੱਲਾ ਫਰਮੇ ਜੁਰ ਮਾਈਕ ਤੇ ਸਤਵਾਨ ਸਤਵਾਨ ਯਾ ਯੂ ਕੈਨ ਸਟਾਰਟ ਡਾਕਟਰ ਸਰ ਓਕੇ ਸੋ now that we knew why the antibody was una- unable to bind at this site because of the structure of the virus we proceeded to investigate the binding of the fab at the two major sites 2f and 3f that showed good binding of the fab the footprints of the fabs at these two sites are highlighted in yellow and white respectively the footprint of a fab or of an antibody is simply the amino acid residues on the host which are contacted by this antibody In this case, we noticed that the 2F and 3F lab binding sites overlap partially with each other near the axis of local social symmetry, as I have highlighted here in pink. What this means is the fab binding event at these two sites is mutually exclusive. Only one fab can bind at a time, either at this site or at this site. The presence of one fab at this site would exclude the binding of fab at this site and vice versa in immunology this is a rather unusual mode of fab binding email address for a photo was that a question or was that just a background conversation found otherwise i'll i'll remove you i jab kiya hota na ho bhi hello miss palak Mm. otherwise i'm removing you not mind okay please continue uh, dr yeah yeah what the stress now um yeah so in immunology this is a rather unusual mechanism wherein the epitopes or footprints for antibodies are overlapping usually you do not find this what happens in immunology is that antibody footprints are usually physically separated from each other which allows multiple copies of the antibody to bind with high avidity in this case however it seems that the antibody footprint is partially overlapping thus leading to low occupancy on the surface of the virus to really understand the implications of this unusual mode of fab binding we constructed a very simple mathematical model here two asymmetric units on the viral surface are shown as triangles the fab binding sites on the surface are shown as ovals the presence of a fab is shown as a solid oval whereas the absence of a fab is shown as a hollow oval so now suppose the first fab were to bind at the 3f site this fab would prevent binding of the second fab at the nearby 2f site because they are partially overlapping however a 3f site fab will allow the binding of the second fab in either the 2f or the 3f site in the nearby metric unit in contrast if the first fab were to bind at the 2f it would prevent binding of the second fab not only at the 3f site but also at the nearby 2f site the only other site where the fab would be allowed to bind is at the far away 3f site in the neighboring asymmetric unit putting these three combinations together model predicts that uh, the 3f site has twice the probability of being occupied by a fab as compared to the 2f site moreover as the surface of the virus contains exactly 60 asymmetric units and only one fab can bind to a symmetric unit under conditions of saturation our model predicts that the virus surface will be covered by exactly 60 copies of the fab next we decided to test this model by determining the occupancy of fabs on the viral surface now i'll tell you a brief concept on why occupancies matter and how you calculate them so forget about the virus story that i've been telling you just imagine that you have a dimer of two proteins one of the monomers in the dimer is yellow whereas the other monomer is red 10 copies of that dimer are arranged in a regular lattice the yellow monomer is present at every single position in the lattice on the other hand the red monomer is present at only 5 of the 10 positions this red monomer is missing from 5 positions hence on an average the occupancy of the more populated red mon yellow monomer i'm sorry will be two times the occupancy of the less populated red monomer hence if you know how much occupancy one monomer has 
you can back calculate how much occupancy the other monomer will have using this concept. We first determine the quantitative electron density fitting values of the envelope protein on the viral surface. Because intact virus particles contain exactly 180 copies of the E protein on the viral surface, this protein is present at 100% occupancy, which means that there is no missing E protein from the viral surface. So now that we assumed uh, assigned a value of 100% to the E protein sequence, we then calculated the corresponding values for the fabs at the 2F and 3F sites, which is over here and over here. Then by comparing these numbers to the E protein occupancy values, we determined that under our experimental conditions, the 3F and 2F sites were occupied in a ratio of 1.9 is to 1, which is extremely close to our prediction of 2 is to 1. Moreover, under our experimental conditions in our cryo-EM experiment, the virus particles were covered on an average by 54 copies of FAB, which is also very close to our prediction of 60 copies. What this implies is that only a very, very tiny amount of the antibody and of the corresponding fabs is required to achieve neutralization. This is because the surface of the virus is such that it does not allow complete and stoichiometric binding of the antibody to all the available epitopes. Hence, a cryoEM experiment was able to address the first of the three questions we had posed at the beginning of the investigation, that is, what is the stoichiometry of binding of the antibody to the viral surface? Now let's move on to the second question. That is, what is the mechanism by which the antibody neutralizes infections? So this is the same simplified flavivirus replication cycle that I showed you at the beginning of this talk. As I said, flavivirus particles enter host cells by receptor-mediated endocytosis. Once inside the cells, the acidification of the endosome lumen triggers a series of conformational changes in the viral surface that convert viral E-protein dimers into fusogenic trimers. These trimers then insert and fuse with the endosomal membrane of the host to release the viral RNA genome from inside the virus into the cytosol of the cell. Now, what I've shown you over here is a Zika virus particle. I'm highlighting over here in black in this black line, a small area on the surface of the virus. In this site, the same area is shown with highlights on three E protein monomers near the 2F fab binding site. Shown over here is again the same area, but with three different monomers highlighted, which are uh, within the footprint of the 3F fab binding site. A close observation of the maps at these two sites shows that the FAB contacts three adjacent E protein monomers, both at the 2F site and the 3F site. This implies that the FAB ZIKV117 acts as a cross-linking agent that links together and locks together E protein monomers, adjacent E protein monomers, to prevent pH-triggered conformational changes from dimer to trimer. This means that the ZIKV117 antibody, and by extension the FAB, is an inhibitor of the pH trigger fusion reaction, which would require E protein dimers to break and reorganize into E protein trimers. Hence, we were able to gain fairly significant insights into the mechanism by which the antibody achieves neutralization. So, as I've mentioned, the E protein dimer is converted into the E protein trimer. The key event in this whole process is disruption of the dimer a conformational change in the, in, in the disrupted monomers, and then reorganization into the trimer. A close inspection of the Zika virus structure shows that there are multiple pathways through which this trimer formation may be achieved. For instance, the two blue monomers that I've highlighted over here could combine with the red monomer, and these three monomers could combine with each other and then form this fusogenic trimer. As an alternative, a blue monomer could combine with the red monomer and a green monomer, and these three monomers could then reorganize into a trimer. Or finally, as the third option, three green monomers lying next to each other could just reorganize with each other and assemble to form the fusogenic trimer. Despite the advances in elucidating the structure and function of this E protein trimer, the identity of the preferred pathway for trimer formation has remained elusive. 
to this end. Another postdoc in Michael Rossman's group determined the structure of the related dengue virus under low pH conditions. This structure showed the presence of 60 symmetric fusogenic trimers on the viral surface, that is, exactly one trimer per asymmetric unit. Now, the only pathway that allows the formation of exactly 60 fusogenic trimers is the one that combines a blue monomer with a red monomer and a green monomer. As it so happens, these three monomers are locked in place by ZIKV117 at its more populated 3F site. Hence, ZIKV117 antibody achieves neutralization by locking together very specific E protein monomers and thereby preventing the reorganization from dimers into fusogenic trimers. So now let's move on to the third and final question. That is, what is the molecular basis of specificity of this antibody to the Zika virus? Using the FAB footprint information derived from a cryovian structure, we then constructed a multiple sequence alignment of residues in the FAB footprint. For this purpose, we used E protein sequences from two different strains of Zika virus, four serotypes of dengue virus, one and one strain each of West Nile virus, Japanese encephalitis virus, and the yellow fever virus. This multiple sequence alignment is color coded. Red indicates complete conservation, yellow partial conservation, and white no conservation. As you can see, the fat footprint is fairly poorly conserved, thereby providing a molecular level explanation as to why this antibody is specific to the Zika virus and does not cross-react with other flaviviruses. Now, why should you care about the lack of cross-reactivity of this antibody? Um, let me just go back over here. Yeah, so why should you care about the lack of cross-reactivity of this antibody? When you study immunology, what you are taught is that if you are able to get your hands on a vaccine, an antibody or any antigen that induces a cross-reactive response, then that is a good thing because it allows you to target and neutralize many related pathogens using one single vaccine therapeutic. Well, in the case of flaviviruses, the situation is not very easy to understand, and it's not very simple. This is because of a phenomenon in immunology that is called antibody-dependent enhancement, or ADE. Now, suppose you have a flavivirus that, is in, that infects an immune system for the very first time. This immune system would typically respond by raising a series of antibodies against the virus. Some of these antibodies will be tightly binding and neutralizing. The virus antibody complex is recognized by cells of the immune system and internalized into these cells. The internalized virus is completely neutralized because of the tightly binding antibodies and hence is cleared from circulation. Now suppose a second flavivirus infects the same immune system. Some of the antibodies raised in the first round of infection will be able to react to the second flavivirus, which is fairly closely related in its sequences to the first flavivirus. Some of these cross-reacting antibodies will bind to the virus, but will fail to neutralize. The virus antibody complex will still be recognized and internalized into cells of the immune system. However, because this internalized virus has not been neutralized, the virus, upon gaining entry into immune system cells, will start a replication cycle. In effect, the virus has used the circulating antibodies of the host to gain entry into host cells. Hence the phrase antibody-dependent enhancement. Now, in the same context, shown over here is a map of the areas that show a large infestation of Aedes aegypti, the common mosquito vector for dengue and Zika viruses. Shown over here is a map that shows the areas which have reported a high incidence of dengue virus infections in the last few years. Together, these two maps imply that the areas of the world which have a very high probability of a Zika virus outbreak already have a high incidence of dengue virus infections, which means that people who stand the greatest risk of Zika virus epidemics already have circulating anti-dengue virus antibodies in their blood. In theory, these dengue virus antibodies can be used for antibody-dependent enhancement of the Zika virus if it were to infect an individual that already has dengue antibodies. In fact, during the recent 
South American epidemic of the Zika virus. This remote possibility was considered such a major health risk that it stimulated active research in this topic, leading to a series of very high profile publications in just a matter of two to three months. Now, here, the reverse also holds true. That is, oops, yeah. Yeah, so the reverse also holds true. That is, if a Zika virus antibody is first introduced into an individual, and then this individual gets infected with a different flavivirus, such as, I don't know, dengue or yellow fever or West Nile, then the Zika virus antibody could, could cross-react with the second flavivirus and enhance its infection, leading to very serious health complications. This would, in theory, inhibit efforts towards vaccine development simply out of fears for ADE. In this case, the antibody ZIKV117 deserves special mention. As I've said, this antibody is specific to the Zika virus and does not cross-react with other flaviviruses. Hence, this antibody does not provide any sort of uh, high risk for individuals who receive a dose for this vaccination. ZIKV117 is therefore now considered a prime leading candidate as a Zika virus passive vaccine, and as of about three months ago, has entered commercial production for human testing. So I'll finish off my talk by just quickly summarizing the results. So we performed cryo-electron microscopy on ZIKV117, an antibody that was isolated from a human patient, complex, and we complexed this antibody with purified infectious Zika virus particles. This antibody was chosen because it is highly protective against the Zika virus, including in pregnant females in, as tested in a mouse model. Using cryo-EM, we were able to find out the stoichiometry of binding of this antibody to the Zika virus surface under saturated conditions, determine how this antibody achieves neutralization through cross-linking of E proteins, and showed that this antibody is specific to the Zika virus because it only recognizes residues that are found in the Zika virus and in no other flavivirus. So finally, I acknowledge a whole bunch of people who helped out with this investigation, including Michael, my postdoctoral advisor and a good friend who's no longer around with us, uh, and a whole bunch of funding that Michael had from the NIH. And uh, finally, these are just a few of the papers that came out from this investigation. I did not talk about um, alpha viruses today, but these two papers, we've published them recently, uh, are on alpha viruses. So all the Zika results that I talked about today were published in this Nature Communications paper, the Nature Structural Molecular Biology paper, and this Nature paper from my collaborators. So with that, I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions as moderated by Neeraj. So thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Saif. So now I request audience, you can ask question. The session is open for the question. Yes, uh, please, Dr. Kailash Tiwari, you can ask your question. Yes, you can unmute yourself, Dr. Tiwari. Yeah. yeah. So I have a question. Uh, yes like uh, there has been some attempts for uh, making the dna vaccine for zika virus so what are the odds for uh, having such kind of vaccine in case of coronavirus DNA um, being uh, easier and uh, faster to prepare so that's a very good question so a dna vaccine i'm, I'm really glad you asked it so a dna vaccine is simpler to manufacture because you're only making dna and you inject essentially introducing the DNA in, um, let me just get rid of this sharing thing. Yeah, so DNA, so with DNA, the thing is it's easier to make in bulk quantities and you can simply introduce it into the patient and that will help you uh, elicit an immune response upon transcription and translation. <laughs> Coronavirus, coronaviruses, there's a big problem though. If you read some of the latest papers that have been published on coronavirus uh, infections in humans, uh, what we've seen is that the complications arise not from the coronavirus, but from an elevated immune response in the lungs, which leads to ALS or acute lung surface injuries. So these acute lung injuries result in pneumonia. The idea that is now being floated around in the field is that any vaccination that is used or developed for coronaviruses 
must not overactivate or hyperactivate the immune system. So it's a fine balance wherein you make a DNA vaccine like you suggest. That would be a good way of doing it. But for the vaccine to be successful, it must only elicit a very controlled immune response and not allow the immune system to go completely out of control. And that is where the real challenge lies for vaccine development in coronaviruses. Okay. Yeah, thank you, sir. Sure. Yeah, others can ask a question. Yeah, please. You can raise your hand or you can just unmute your mic and you can ask a question. Yeah. Yeah, you can ask. Ms. Suthar, yeah, you can ask. Uh, so, uh, Mr. this coronavirus is, uh, what, do you, what do we know about antibody dependent enhancement? Is there any kind of antibody dependent enhancement known so far? Um, again, a good question. Um, it's unknown at this stage, let's put it that way. It's not clear what's happening. Uh, mainly because what people have seen is that acute lung injury that they're seeing due to overactivation of the immune system is probably not because of antibodies. It is thought that this is either due to a cytokine storm or an interleukin storm, one of those two, and I I'm mixing them up right now. But it's usually a, a, some sort of a chemokine response wherein you produce so much of the immune modulators that your immune system essentially rushes all its resources around the lungs. Once it rushes everything along, uh, around the lungs following a coronavirus infection, all the response in the lungs leads to the accumulation of fluids and extensive cell death. So to first answer your question, it is not well understood whether you have ADE in coronaviruses. The complication here in coronaviruses seems to be due to chemokines rather than antibodies. Okay, and uh, another question is in case of Zika viruses, uh, uh, do we have any uh, knowledge about uh, cross protection from an, any other vaccine which is being used? So as of now, there are no safe vaccines for flaviviruses in general. There is a vaccine out there for dengue virus uh, that was introduced, I think, by Sanofi about a year and a half ago. Um, so that's a chimeric dengue virus vaccine. Uh, the only effect, there are two effective vaccines, uh, traditional vaccines against flavies. One is against the yellow fever virus and the other is against Japanese encephalitis. There is, there is laboratory evidence of cross protection between Zika and dengue. Uh, if the footprint or the epitope on the viral surface is highly immunogenic and tightly binding to the antibodies. For weak epitopes, it actually leads to ADE. So again, it's a very fine balancing act between how tightly the antibodies bind versus how loosely they bind and lead to ADE. So in terms of cross protection, yes, in the laboratory, there is evidence of Zika and dengue cross protection. Okay. There's one question. Yeah, please, Akshay sir, please. Uh, Will the immunomodulator uh, therapy along with the vaccine is going to be approved to be a beneficial in case of the uh, COVID? It's a very good point. It's an extremely good point. Yes, I, I believe so. Absolutely. Absolutely. So in fact, uh, that's one of the things that is being suggested these days. Um, and maybe that has been tried already. So this whole idea of hydroxychloroquine, why is it useful? Now, one of the things that hydroxychloroquine, if you, th if you read about it, uh, hydroxychloroquine or chloroquines in general are immunomodulators. Uh, they are given to patients who have rheumatoid arthritis or other immune autoimmune disease like SLE, lupus and stuff like that. Because in these diseases, uh, autoimmune diseases, you have a hyperactive immune system and hydroxychloroquine and related drugs are often beneficial in toning down the immune response. So in this case, Yes, there is a possibility, there's a good chance that maybe adding an immunomodulator like you suggest would actually help control the immune system uh, response. And then you would give the patient enough time to mount an antibody response based on the vaccine that patient has received. But again, this is a very fine balancing act because 
if you increase the amount and dosage of immune suppressants, you are making the patient susceptible to a vastly exploding viral population. So again, I think it's a very difficult and fine balancing act to follow as to how much immune modulation you should do while giving a vaccination, while the patient is already infected with the virus. So, ye, so yes, it's, it's a complicated answer, but yes, in theory, it should definitely help. And second question regarding the same with respect to the uh, testing of the COVID. Uh, yes. IgG and IgM, both are the responsible for the, uh, the protection, so basically for the detection of the uh, virus. Secondly, yes. the appearance of these two antibodies is going to be difficult. It is a delayed one. So how, mm -hmm. how do you think that it is going to be a rapid antibody test is going to be a very useful test in the screening of the patients? Yeah, that's a difficult question to answer. It's a great question, but difficult to answer mainly because I think Abbott Labs is the only uh, company that's been able to make a decent antibody diagnostic test for COVID-19 so far. Uh, there are other many other tests, but none of them has been able to match the benchmarks that were set by Abbott recently. How you would detect, uh, I mean, it takes a few days before an IgM response occurs. So if you were to have very low titers and you are in early stages of exposure to the virus, it would be virtually impossible to test with an antibody test. In that case, you would probably need a PCR or polymerase based assay to do early detection. So I don't think, in my opinion, that an antibody-based test would help you in early, very early detection, let's put it that way. Thank you very much for your nice talk sure. also. Yeah, you're welcome. Yeah, others can ask, please. And I request particularly students, uh, a majority of audience are student here, so you can ask your question, right? If you are not feasible in English, you can ask, in Hindi also, no problem. Yeah, I don't have any problems. Yeah. Hindi, I can talk in Hindi, no problem. Yeah. Okay, so uh, I think uh, no questions. Okay. So, uh, yeah, sir, Akshay sir, do you have any question? No, no, thank you. Okay. okay yeah. Uh, so uh, finally, uh, on behalf of AN Patel PG Institute, on behalf of all the audience. Okay. So I'm sorry, Bhumi Puriya, uh, you are asking something. Bhumi, if you are asking, you can ask your question. We have time actually. We have sufficient time. Yeah. No, no, sir, no, sir. Okay. Okay. All right. So on behalf of uh, as a PG Institute, uh, on behalf of all the audience, so I thank uh, Dr. Seif for a wonderful lecture. So. Thank you for having me. This was fun. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And so it's always you. good to uh, reconnect with Neeraj. Yeah, He's one you. of my best friends. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Seif. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, so now we uh, start uh, another session, but problem is that uh, Dr. Uh, Rajesh Patel lost his internet connection. So maybe uh, we'll wait for a couple of minutes and uh, if he connect, then we start second session. So please wait, I'm trying to connect him. And in the meanwhile, you, if you have a question, you can ask to Dr. Saif. Yes. I'm happy to answer any questions. Kisi bara ka koi sawal ho, anything. Kisi ko GRE ke baare mein kuch puchna hai, PhD ke liye kaise apply karna hai, kuch bhi. I'm happy to answer any questions. Yes, Apurva. Yes, sir. Uh, just a minute. I'm connecting. Uh, Hello. Uh, uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, yes. Uh, yeah. So actually, I wanted to ask about uh, that. I'm interesting. 
am pursuing my PhD from foreign, and I am uh -huh. just um, doing microbiology MSc from um, N Patel. So I wanted to know that uh, what should be the next step for applying to foreign PhD courses and what kind of exams I need to do, what kind of preparations I need to have for that all. So if you guys, yes. it will be. Yeah, so um, if you're going to apply to the US, many schools now don't need a GRE. So the first thing you should do is if you, when you apply, before you apply, go online and take a look at the uh, requirements for different schools. Usually you can just Google, because you're a microbiologist, I'm just gonna assume that you're interested in microbiology for your PhD. So with that assumption, I'll give you an example. Let's say you're interested in a certain university. Google it, go to the microbiology department webpage and at the very top, they'll have something like graduate admissions. Look at that tab. They will have requirements for the admissions. There is no satellite test in the US for admissions. There's nothing like net, okay, it doesn't exist. So what you have to do is figure out for every single university that you're interested in, what do they specifically want for that program? So go to the websites, take a look. So that's how it goes for the US. Um, for England, I think you need to do the IELTS exam. And uh, okay. that's pretty much it. And for Germany, I think you'll have to take a look because I remember the Max Planck Institute used to ask for GRE. Some of them did when I was applying, when Neeraj and I were MSc students. And uh, some of them don't ask for anything, only either token or IELT. So take a look at that. Also, if you're doing your MSc, and it may not be a bad idea to work as a research associate or a project assistant for one year and try to get a publication before you apply. Getting okay, sir, but um, yeah. for that, what, what should I do? What should I do? What should I do? What should I do? Okay, project assistant, what should I do? Exactly, sir. Project assistant, what should I do? Okay. Uh, actually, Neera sir advised me a lot. Uh, as he conducts my next classes, I am a student hmm. of his next classes. So mm -hmm. Neeraj sir also inspires me, but uh, mm -hmm. I again wanted to know about uh, that as you told for searching the uh, universities in the foreign, right? So, mm -hmm. uh, yeah, exactly. But uh, the next question comes is that which is the best place? Uh, means being student, we always are going to search like that this is the topmost university for this school, this is the topmost mm -hmm. uni university for this. So what will be the best, which place will be the best for doing a PhD if I get uh, get there, so get a chance to go there? So, two things you should remember that what is the best definition and second, what is the best school you should take? This is the question. I'm not saying this for you, but I'm generally saying this. Okay. Exactly, sir. I when I applied for it, so when I applied for it, I remember I have four, no, I have applied for a lot of places. I have applied for 12 places in the US. So, I think four or five places have given me an offer and seven have rejected me. So, the 12 places I have given in my application, I had three in three groups. The first group was my top schools, which I have applied for Harvard, Stanford, Columbia and Purdue. ये चार अप्लाई किया था ये मेरे टॉप स्कूल्स थे चार फिर मैंने मिडिल रंग में अप्लाई किया था जिसमें आई थिंक नॉर्थ ईस्टर्न आयोवा स्टेट यूनिवर्सिटी ऑफ ह्यूस्टन और कुछ तो मेरा ये था कि अगर पहले चार में से किसी ने भी मुझे ऑफर कर दिया जो मेरे टॉप चार स्कूल थे आईएस रैंकिंग वाले जो थे तो मैं वहां चला जाऊंगा अगर उन चार में से नहीं किया तो मिडिल रैंक वाले में तो अभी नहीं हुआ तो नीचे तो मेरे साथ हुआ ये कि टॉप चार में जो मैंने अप्लाई किया था हार्वर्ड ने मुझे रिजेक्ट कर दिया था शायद टैंफोर्ड ने रिजेक्ट कर दिया था कोलंबिया ने रिजेक्ट कर दिया था पर्यू ने मुझे ऑफर दे दिया तो चार में से एक ने मुझे ऑफर दे दिया था तो फिर मेरे लिए आगे सोचने की कोई बात ही नहीं थी कि टॉप चार में से एक ने मिल गया तो मैं वहां चला गया था इसमें आपको करना ही चाहिए कि आपको रैंकिंग देख लेनी चाहिए और रैंकिंग देख के डिसाइड कर लीजिए कि क्या क्या अवेलेबल है क्या क्या रैंक अवेलेबल है और उसमें सेलेक्ट कर लीजिए आप कि क्या कुछ टॉप स्कूल कुछ मिडिल और कुछ सेफ स्कूल्स सबके दो तीन दो दो स्कूल ओके थैंक यू सो मच सर योर टॉक वाज वेरी नाइस या थैंक यू वेलकम थैंक यू ओके सो इफ यू हैव एनी अदर क्वेश्चन अदर पार्टिसिपेंट्स यू कैन आस्क वी आर टेकिंग विथ टाइम कनेक्ट डॉक्टर राजेश पटेल एक्चुअली ही लास्ट स्टेज इंटरनेट कनेक्टिविटी uh, so if you have any questions hello good morning sir yeah please ask yes yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, here the i am a faculty in christ college uh, 
in bi- bioinformatics department your our students are majority are looking to move uh, outside the country but uh, right. their parents are uh, continuously contacting us after their graduations they are looking for the pg to go but they are worrying that in this covid 19 shall we send our uh, our uh, guy our family guys to there or not so they are worrying for their daughters and son so what you said is that uh, how we can uh, Uh, came out of these situations and we can uh, get rid out of it and shall we send our students uh, to abroad or not it's a very good question and unfortunately there are no easy answers mm-hmm. uh, i i i think or even if you have received an admission of a letter and even if you accepted the offer i think all the embassies are closed right now mm-hmm. so there's no way that you can go for a visa interview mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. in this right. situation um so i'll give you an example my own uh, puppy's daughter she lives in lucknow uh, she mm-hmm. uh, just received an offer from a university in canada she's in canada so she's in liberal arts she lives in lucknow she's received the offer she's accepted the offer it's okay. fully funded for a phd but mm-hmm. now because the embassy is closed there's no way she can get to canada right they, they, yeah, she yeah, can't yeah. get to an interview so what Perfect. she's doing is she's waiting she's waiting so that's one option you have to wait but the thing is with this covid-19 situation everything is so unpredictable it's really not well understood as to what is going to happen uh, in terms of basic science and research uh, how much money will be available or whether uh, people will start losing their jobs simply because the economy will crash we don't know we have no idea it's a great unknown it may not be a bad idea at this stage to maybe wait another 6 months okay just to stay safe because in most cases in most i came from a very middle class background so i understand mm-hmm. financial limitations so if you invest a whole lot of money and apply to universities abroad and then nothing right. comes out of it that the whole lot of investment on your part with no returns True. so so in that case i would suggest it might be best to wait maybe 6 months or so just see okay. how things progress if things hopefully god willing start to look better then yes go ahead start applying start doing visa interviews but in the meantime it may not be a bad idea to absorb a few people at least at least on a temporary basis in india in local colleges in universities and make sure that they continue with their education and later on when things start to improve maybe some of them them can move out yeah uh, that's good idea sir yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, thank thank you very much sir thank sure. you you welcome okay. any participant if you have any question you can ask okay so uh, i am not able to connect uh, dr rajesh patel actually he lost his internet connectivity uh, so Uh, and he sent uh, some recording but uh, it is very large file and uh, is not i'm not able to download that file so uh, and uh, it is not advisable to wait for a longer time i think so uh, if, uh, the participants is not having any question we can uh, end up our meeting here so i'm so sorry for that so internet connectivity is not there so uh, if nobody is having question then we can end up our session and uh, we'll try to manage some other time dr rajesh patel's lecture so thank you very much thank you very much to all the participants thank you very much to dr saif for delivering a, a very very informative very uh, you know nice lecture as well as the very nice interaction with our participants so thank you yeah, i'm i'm happy to do that if you guys have any problems uh, any questions for me just send them to neeraj or connect with me and i'm happy to help any time yeah so thank you very much thank you very much to all participants okay. thank you all thank you